Hello and welcome to today's session through the Baldwin Professional Education Connection. We have quite the robust topic for you today on the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, essentially an overview of compliance, regula uh, compliance obligations. My name is Marie Smith and I will be your moderator for today. Today's session is being recorded and we will share all the slides once the recording is complete so you have them for future reference as well. At the end of today's session, we will have some time for a Q&A session. So feel free to type any questions as we go along and we will try to address them at the end of the presentation. Lastly, anyone looking to receive professional education credit through SHRM or HRCI for today's session, you will receive all the information you need to submit for these credits at the end of the session. Please know the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative is not a law firm and cannot provide legal advice. We are providing this information to you solely in our capacity as consultants with knowledge and experience in the industry, but not as legal advice. For more information on mental health parity or to review related, related agency guidance issued by the Department of Labor, please visit the following websites. Today, I am joined by Bill Freeman, who is the Associate Director, and Jason Sheffield, the National Director of Compliance here at the Baldwin Reg Regulatory Compliance Collaborative. Again, my name is Marie Smith, and I am a National Technical Trainer for Employee Benefits, and I am your moderator for today. Jumping into the agenda, we are gonna start with a little history on mental health parity, and then move on to the general requirements. We will discuss how to identify and evaluate quantitative and non-quantitative treatment limitations. In part five, we will review the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act disclosure requirements, and after that, we will open up for your questions. As this is an educational program, and it's designed to provide you with the knowledge and understanding related to the following learning objectives. Number one, become familiar with the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act and how employer-sponsored benefit plans are expected to comply with its provisions. Understand that mental health parity requires a formal analysis of plan data and narrative report to assure mental health substance use disorder benefits are in, paid in parity to mental medical surgical benefits under the benefit plan. Number three, learn the six benefit classifications and two subclassifications that must provide mental health and substance use benefits in parity with medical and surgical benefits. Number four, identify the quantitative treatment limitations and understand how the substantially all standard applies to financial requirements and how the predominant level standard applies to treatment limitations. Number five, gain an understanding of non-quantitative treatment limitations and how plan design must be assessed and measured to assure the compliance with Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And number six, understand the Department of Labor expectations of self-insured and insured plan sponsors and the disclosure requirements to the Department of Labor and plan participants. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Jason. Hi, Marie. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to start here in part one with the legislative history of MAPIA and the current enforcement landscape from the DOL and from uh, CMS. All right, next slide, please. So the legislative history of, of mental health parity and addiction equity uh, is kind of uh, lengthy and a little tenuous of how it started off. Um, our early beginnings were back all the way in 1996 with the Mental Health Parity Act. This required parity respecting aggregate annual and or lifetime dollar limits for mental, for mental health uh, versus medical surgical benefits, but it included substance use disorder benefits. Hopping forward to 2008, we got the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which is the substance of what we're talking about today, MAPIA, which required parity in all medical surgical, um, with respect to medical surgical uh, benefits um, as to mental health and substance use disorder benefits. So parity across all lines there. It became law on October 3rd of 2008, uh, effective for years beginning um, October 3rd of 2009 or January the 1st of 2010 for calendar year plans. Interim final rules were published thereafter in February of 2010, and then final rules were published uh, November 13th of 2013, um, effective for plan years beginning July 1st, 2014, or January 1st, 2015 for calendar year plans. So that's where we got the bulk of our provisions there. 2010, we get the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or the ACA, and that applied the MAPIA standards to the individual health insurance marketplace and to qualified health health plan exchanges that were offered and maintained by federal or state authorities. 
So then in jump to 2016, we get the 21st Century Cures Act. This act directed the Department of Labor to increase MAPIA enforcement. And so this was a directive, the first time Congress really stepped out other than the adoption of the act uh, or the passing of the, of the legislation to say, we got to do something about enforcement here because while we have all these great MAPIA standards and these, and these kind of wishes, we're not implementing any of this from an enforcement perspective. So there was a little nudge to the DOL to come up with some, some enforcement um, information and standards and also to start uh, proliferating additional subregulatory and regulatory content from the agency to help employers comply with their uh, requirements under MAPIA. 2021, we get the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the CAA. This required a formal written analysis, a comparison of medical surgical NQTLs and reporting of data and results to federal agencies. So this is where we get this first kind of um, demonstrative obligation upon employer plan sponsors that they're going to have to have it maintain, create and maintain a written formal analysis um, demonstrating their comparison activities and their elective activities uh, respective of NQTLs or non-quantitative treatment limitations. In 2022, we get the 2022 MAPIA report to Congress. Here, uh, the, uh, this was a report from the Secretaries of Labor, Health and Human Services and, and the Treasury. And here again, there was an emphasis on enforcement, what activities have taken place, what's coming down the pipe, and then also efforts to interpret, implement, and enforce all of the various amendments to MAPIA that were made by the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Now, that's a lot. Keep in mind, in the background also, you're getting all of this regulatory advice, guidance, FAQs, um, worksheets, all kinds of stuff coming out from the DOL along the same timeline. So there's really a huge body of information relative to the legislative history here and agency history of behavioral health protections. Next slide, please. All right, so in 2022, uh, the DOL was, was directed by Congress to prepare a report that would be delivered to Congress that would update Congress on the status of mental health parity, allowed um, enforcement, and, and the development of the employer kind of experience so that employers understood what their obligations were and how to comply. So during that audit, or that, that initiative, uh, the Employee Benefits Security Administration issued 156 letters to plans, insurers, requesting comparative analysis for 215 unique non-quantitative treatment limitations. And these were spanning 86 different or unique EBSA investigations. So what they're looking at is think, so you've got 156 letters across plans and insurers, and these arise from 86 different investigations. Within those 86 investigations, they looked at 215 different NQTLs. So some plans had multiple NQTLs, uh, and some only had one or two. So uh, it was that we were looking for unique NQTLs across that base of um, investigations or plans. From that, in that report, we found out that the DOL issued 80 insufficient, insufficiently letters, insufficiency letters uh, related to 170 NQTLs. We're gonna and we're gonna explain NQTLs and go into a lot of definitions in just a bit. So you'll have a little more uh, background on what this means. 30 initial determin deter determination letters were issued, finding that 48 NQTLs imposed on mental health and substance use disorder benefits lacked parity with medical surgical benefits. So there were 36 unique ones within that, that lump of 48. And then corrective action plans from 19 plans were received in response to initial determination letters. Corrective action plan is where the enforcing agency comes up with a plan cooperatively with the employer to move into compliance voluntarily or with the added incentive of the imposition of civil monetary penalties, depending on how uh, egregious the breach activity is or the misstep um, compliance obligation is. So um, that's kind of the overview of what was in that 2022 report to Congress. Not very promising. Next slide. So in that report to Congress, EPSA outlined some of the, some of the common themes and the deficiencies that it identified. I'm not going to go through all of these because you'll have access to the slide afterward, the deck afterward, but I will hit on a few of the highlights. First one here, failure to document comparative analysis before designing and applying an NQTL. So what they're saying here is that an employer failed to document the analysis that it was conducting to actually design and apply an NQTL. So you have to go into this as a carrier or as a self-insured employer by looking at the various limitations that you're going to put in your plan that are non-quantitative in nature and determining what is the analytic process behind the imposition of that requirement and how are you going to offer it or, or require it in a parity-like manner. 
Uh, conclusory assertions lacking specific supporting evidence. This one is really common. And when you read some of the reports, it just kind of screams out at you where employers just said, we've complied with this because we state we complied with it. Um, there isn't actually any background information that demonstrates how the employer, um, from a facts and circumstances situation, was actually doing the analytic process of compliance and, and importing that or kind of uh, incorporating that into their plan. Lack of meaningful comparison or meaningful analysis. There again, that's kind of back to the conclusory assertions. And you can see these goes on. These go on, and there's some real specific ones as you go further down the list. But basically, what this all comes down to is the employers, while they have are starting to get like a general understanding of what Athena requires, they're still very uncomfortable with that deep dive analysis that has to that has to be conducted. And most of these um, deficiencies, the themes and deficiencies relate in one way or another to the implementation and rollout of these requirements at the plan level and how an employer was unable to demonstrate from an analytic process establishing and administering its NQTLs and QTLs. Next slide, please. Um, now, the other, other agency here that's got an operative kind of enforcement hand in this is the Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services. They issued 15 letters between May and November of 2021 to issuers in states where CMS has direct enforcement authority over the PIA. Now, that would be Texas, Missouri, and Wyoming. And then there are also non-federal government plan sponsors in those other states that would be um, regulated by CMS as well. Um, so of 19 insufficiency letters there, 15 initial determination letters were issued to plans and issuers finding 16 NQTLs out of parity. Um, and there were 14 comparative analysis remain insufficient. Uh, now, that's of 15 letters. So that's like a 95% failure rate. Um, corrective action plans received from six plans and insurers in response to the initial determination letters. And those caps uh, resulted in 13, um, addressed 13 of those prior existing NQTLs that were offensive. All right, next slide, please. All right, so current MAPIA related agency enforcement activities, where are we today? So we get this report to Congress. Uh, Congress says, okay, DOL, you've got to provide more education to employer plan sponsors and carriers so they understand these obligations better because that's the reason they're not complying. The other reason why they're not complying is that there aren't really very robust enforcement related penalties for non-conforming employers. So there was a big push at the end of throughout 2022, particularly in the budget reconciliation process at the end of 2022, to impose some new uh, civil monetary penalties uh, a new structure and some new guidelines for increasing enforcement penalties for non-compliant employers. That did not pass. That was not incorporated in the end of the year reconciliation uh, legislation that was passed. So DOL kind of chimed in and said, okay, we're going to continue to do our uh, development of resources and tools, but we can't increase, we can increase enforcement activities, but not penalties. So that remains one that's not uh, particularly robust at the moment. Um, so there's the DOL guidance there reflecting, reflecting that decision making and, and the rollout of those expectations. The DOL expects compliance activities by self-funded plans specifically to include a review of your SPDs and other disclosures to assure compliance. That would include all your plan documents that are going uh, that are just disseminations, performance of claim audits, utilization reviews. So this is actually looking at the claims that are processed through your plans and assuring that they are uh, processed and approved or denied with an eye toward mental health parity compliance. Assurances that program structure do not violate the QTL or NQTL limits that we're going to talk about today in this program. And then participant disclosure of all medical necessity determinations. And this is one where a lot of employers are misstep. So at the end, we'll have a whole separate section that we'll talk about what are the participant uh, notification requirements here under this, um, under this legislation and these agency rules as they stand today. The DOL also has compliance expectations of fully insured plans. So this is not just a self-funded plan exercise. For fully insured plans, you still have to have a written, um, a written uh, analysis of your NQTLs, but it's going to be prepared by your carrier, not by you. Uh, you just really need a certificate from your carrier that indicates that they, have, they are complying with MPIA and that they have conducted the uh, comparative written analysis and have that available for DOL purposes for audit. Um, as we said earlier, the CAA of 2021 imposed this new written um, uh, comparative analysis obligation on conforming employers. So that was when 2021 is when this rolls out that you have to have this actual formal, formal analysis on standby so that if the DOL, CMS, or a participant requests a copy of your mental health parity analysis of NQTLs, 
versus the mental health and substance I mean, medical surgical benefits under your plan, you actually have this beginning in 2021, this requirement to produce it. All right, next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna jump to part two, general MAPIA requirements. Here's where we're gonna to start to dive into the actual substantive requirements of mental health parity. All right, so there's basically four big intents and kind of requirements here in MAPIA. The first one is it requires mental health and addiction-related medical services parity. What we mean by parity is that when I look at the plan's coverage, what it covers, what it pays, the benefits it pays, generally, is there a relationship that makes sense between mental health, substance use disorder benefits, and medical surgical benefits under the plan? And by make sense, that it's offered equally. So that, say, if you had a financial requirement or a limitation um, requirement that said you could get 10 counseling sessions for mental health per year, in the equivalent classification of benefits on the medical surgical side, you'd have to have a 10 visit limit per year as well. So that's what we mean by parity. Whatever we do on one side, on the mental health substance use disorder side, we have to imply a similar, not the exact same, but a similar limitation on the medical surgical side. MAPIA does not impose mandatory um, mental health substance use disorder coverage requirements. Now that is kind of open to interpretation at this point. That was under mental health parity originally. Um, MAPIA's uh, under MAPIA, as the agency guidance has evolved and additional um, legislation has passed, there's getting to get to this point where we're saying, okay, maybe this is mandatory um, that you have mental health substance use disorder benefits. Now, there's not a specific mandate still, but if you are going to offer any benefits, they have to be offered in parity, the medical surgical. And if you don't offer benefits, you have to send a letter to all of your participants and eligible enrollees that you don't cover mental health or substance use disorder, use disorder benefits. Most employers from an attraction and retention standpoint don't want to send that letter out. So effectively, this is a requirement. Uh, the status of enforcement activities we've talked about, uh, written comparative analysis as required beginning February 10th of 2021. And this is that requirement, which is probably why you're joining us today is the preparation and availability of this comparative analysis data for mental health parity compliance. So we'll talk a lot about that today. Next slide. All right, so com common compliance challenges. These are just a couple of things that we hear frequently from employers when we bring up the mental health parity conversation. We reviewed our SPDs and there are no visible compliance issues. Well, that's, that can be helpful, but it doesn't tell the whole story. You've got to look further than the SPDs. You have to look at your plan administration manuals. You have to look at your certificates, certificates of insurance and plan documents. You have to look at your history of claims and utilization to make the determination of whether not only does your plan accurately state mental health parity compliance, does it actually implement that and administer it on a day-to-day -day basis? And you're going to need a lot more than SPDs in order to accomplish that and to demonstrate that. Our vendors and carriers have assured us that we are MAPIA compliant. Remember, if you're self-funded employer, this is up to you, not your carriers or your vendors. You have to be the one to demonstrate that you're compliant. It's up to you to make sure that that written comparative analysis is prepared and available to enforcing agency. And it's up to you to be the arbitrator or the final arbiter on claims related to mental health parity and substance use disorder benefits. So really, you have the operational administrative hand here. We cover applied behavioral analysis. This comes up a lot um, with employers because they say we cover ABA, which is a spectrum disorder um, therapy. Um, autism spectrum disorder. And so we are on a litigation risk. A lot of the early litigation on mental health parity related to um, autism spectrum disorders and benefits that were available in relationship to those. Um, so there was this early on understanding or interpretation that if you covered ABA, you were fine with mental health parity. That is not the case. That is not the instance whatsoever. There are a range of compliance expectations for employers here um, that non-performance of would create litigation risk. We offer a high deductible health plan so there is no way we could fail to fail our MAPIA testing. Here again, this is just pretty much blatantly false. Um, your MAPIA testing and your availability and offer of a high medical health plan really aren't so much commingled that one depends upon the other. These are two independent processes. The compliance requirements for HTAPs are primarily under Treasury Department rules. MAPIA rules are primarily under DOL rules. So they're, they're really not applied or interpreted in the same way. And they're certainly not enforced. Five, we charge a low copay for mental health benefits, coinsurance for medical surgical, so we are compliant. Um, so what they're saying here is we charge a low copay on our mental health and substance use disorder benefits, but we have low coinsurance rates as compared to medical surgical, so we're compliant. Remember, this isn't just about how much you charge, how much you pay, or what coinsurance looks like. 
This goes into the design aspects of the underlying coverage of that line of coverage and whether and to what extent medical surgical benefits are often generally in parity to mental health and substance use disorder benefits. So it's not just the cost aspect. It's also the availability of treatments and services, the range of benefits that are available, um, whether and to what extent a claim is denied and why. So all of these pieces kind of play into this puzzle. Lastly, we've never been contacted by the DOL or another government agency. This one we hear a lot. Uh, most employers are, a lot of employers are under the impression or the assumption that if they are audited, they'll have time to prepare this report and deliver it on a timely basis to the agency. That is pretty much patently, patently false. Um, the comparative analysis for a basic, very simple, single-tier plan is probably going to take a month to prepare, to do all the research and to prepare the report, and you're probably going to have to engage a third-party vendor or professional services organization to do that for you or to work with you to produce it. Um, generally, the response time on these audit letters is 14 days. You can request one standard ex, um, ex, extension. So you're not going to have time to do it. So we'd like you to get on it now if you can. All right, next slide. All right, so summary of MAPIA's compliance readiness process. So there are steps here. Um, if you look at the end of the presentation, once you get the course materials, you'll see there are two appendices. One has some common, has a glossary of common definitions, and the other one has an overview of compliance steps for employers. So kind of a worksheet you can use to perform this limited assessment of where you stand with MAPIA compliance. Um, for purposes of this piece of it, there are six steps. First, you just confirm whether the group health plan is subject to MAPIA. That's kind of your initial threshold inquiry. Are we subject to MAPIA? If so, then you're going to go on to two through six. We'll talk a little more about that on the following slides. Remove any aggregate lifetime or annual dollar limits. Remember, we talked about the imposition um, or the prohibition against aggregate lifetime or annual dollar limits when we talked about the legislative history. So let's make sure that we take those out in step two. Step three, let's analyze each quant quantitative treatment limitation or QTL. So this would be a visit, a lab procedure, a pharmacy refill, any type of limitation imposed on specific treatments or services. And for each financial requirement, so that would be a deductible, a copayment, insurance, an out-of-pocket maximum, or any other participant share requirement, and confirm whether those underlying limitations are applied to mental health, surgical, I mean, mental health and substance use disorder benefits no more restrictively than the predominant quantitative treatment limitation quantitative treatment limitation or financial requirement that's applied substantially to all medical surgical benefits in the same classification. This is a very complex definition. There's lots of parts we have to unpack, but we're going to do it in the presentation today. So um, we're going to talk about benefit classifications in just a moment and how that and how you test this. And then we'll talk about the substantially all and predominant tests and how those create kind of the analytic structure of this analysis. In step four, we confirm that the processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, and other factors that an employer utilize uh, when applying the non-quantity of treatment limitations, analyze its compliance with mental health parity. Um, we're gonna see if those are applied and written in the documents in the same way that they are on, on the medical surgical side as they are on the mental health side. So it's not just writing it in your documents. And I alluded to this earlier. Remember, it's not just how you write it in your plans. Like having a compliant plan document is one part that's very important. But also equally important is that operationally, you are complying with the standards that you can demonstrate. Step five is GAP, consider mental health and substance use disorder benefits provided by the plan. Confirm whether the available benefits are provided in each benefit classification, which we're going to cover the classifications in a few moments, and for which medical surgical benefits are provided. So the couple of steps there, identify the mental health and substance use disorder benefits and treatments and services available under your plan. Then once you've identified them, make a list of them. Confirm whether those benefits, treatments, and services are provided in each benefit classification. There are six and four subclassifications. We're going to talk about those in a minute. And then go back and apply that or compare it to medical surgical benefits that are provided in similar classifications and subcategories. So create a list and then create a list on both sides, medical surgical and substance use disorder um, and, then, and, 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 pair, and uh, mental health. And then get your two lists and then comply them. And then um, compare them in the middle. Step six, ensure participant disclosure to perform and then all supporting documentation, evidence and performance of the requirement via compliance activities is maintained. So the burden of proof is on the employer here. You have to maintain these records um, where you establish your evidentiary standards and you do your testing and you roll out these prohibitions and these other limitations. All right, next slide, please. Now, this first initial inquiry or threshold determination of whether a plan is subject to MAPIA 
is an important one, obviously, because you don't want to do all this if you're not required to do it. Uh, retiree plans. So if a plan is available for retired workers, it is exempt from most of the mental health substance use disorder parity requirements that apply to, uh, this applies to group health plans that do not cover at least two employees who are current employees, at least two employees who are current employees. So if you have participants that are both actively employed and retirees on a common platform, that would not apply here. This is only solely purely retiree health plans, you get a waiver there. Plans with a separate standalone waiver. This could be a self-insured plan, the non-federal plan, those are uh, pretty uh, pretty much not coming anymore, though. Uh, the employer must maintain an active repeal waiver in order for it to be applicable. So these waivers were uh, a little more available, readily available at the beginning. Uh, I would say back in 2013, moving forward, but they're pretty difficult to put your hands on these days. Uh, accepted benefits. So this is where you have benefits that are applicable to group health plans and individual plans, such as limited dental or vision plans. Uh, they are not subject to the repeal requirement. Um, small employers. So if you employ an average of at least two, but not more than 50 employees, you may get a break on MOPIA compliance. This is measured in business days during the preceding calendar year. You have to employ at least one employee on the first day of the plan year that you are actually testing and preparing your report for. Cost exemptions. Now, this was um, early on, this was available for plans to make changes to comply with MOPIA and increase cost uh, where they could demonstrate that that compliance cost was going to be at least 2%. Uh, their operational costs in the first year, their benefit costs in the first year. And then after that, changes uh, are made of at least 1% respecting subsequent years. So if you can demonstrate that uh, you can't make those costs increase, then they are a significant hardship for your organization. You may be able to get away with there. All right, next slide. Evaluate whether the program is subject to Maria. Um, yeah, our next set of standards here. Does the plan offer mental health and or substance use disorder benefits? If you don't offer any of these benefits, and you're sending out your letter to your participants to notify them, then you don't have to test for mental health parity compliance. If you are offering them, is there an available exception or exemption that applies to the plan issuer? Covered those on the other slide. If no, the plan administrators must analyze the plan to assure substantive compliance with OPIA's requirements. So let's step our feet into that box. Next slide. All right. The first one here is our lifetime and annual limit considerations. As I've mentioned twice, we do have a prohibition here generally um, against lifetime and annual limit considerations or annual limit uh, restrictions for employer plan sponsors with respect to self-funded plans um, and uh, fully insured plans to carriers for mental health and substance use disorder benefits. Um, it can't be lower than the lifetime or annual dollar limit that's imposed on medical surgical benefits. So there's a tricky little clause in that statement. It's not just that you can have them. You can have these limitations but they can't be lower than those limitations that you oppose respecting medical surgical benefits. So it's not an out and out prohibition against them. It's just saying that if you're going to have them, they have to be applied in parity. Uh, the prohibition applies to uh, applies only to dollar limits on what the plan would pay and not to dollar limits on what an individual might be charged. So this is really looking at what the plan's paying, not what an individual is actually going to pay out of pocket. If a plan or issuer does not include an aggregate lifetime or annual dollar limit, on any medical surgical benefits. So if you don't have anything on medical surgical at all with respect to aggregate lifetime or annual dollar limits, but it includes at least one that applies to no less than one third of all medical surgical benefits, it may not impose an aggregate lifetime or annual dollar limit respecting its mental health and substance use disorder benefits. So that's kind of like the base rule there and then you build up from that rule. Next slide, please. All right, so rules of the road here. So first, remember, uh, parity says health plans that provide mental health substance use disorder benefits to its, benefit, to its uh, participants have to provide those benefits in parity with medical surgical benefits. As I mentioned before, and Bill's going to dive into these very deeply today, we have financial requirements or quantitative treatment limitations, and then we have non-quantitative treatment limitations. Group health plans that cover medical surgical benefits and mental health substance use disorder benefits that also impose financial requirements. And the financial requirement would be deductible, co-payment, insurance, or out-of-pocket maximum, or if they apply or impose a quantitative treatment limitation. So this would be a limitation respecting the number of visits to a particular type of practitioner or a particular type of service or treatment, the days of coverage you're eligible for, days in a waiting period. All of that has to apply um, no, more, no more restrictively than the predominant financial requirements that are applied on the medical surgical side. So that's your QTL and uh, financial requirements limitation. 
or restriction. On the non-quantitative treatment limitations, now these are going to be things like prior authorization, utilization review, uh, things where the carrier is involved in an analytic process of its own that's directed by generally the employer under the standards of the plan to make uh, to put kind of barriers to treatment and services where they need to do prior authorization or they need to do an intensive review of the terms of treatment, say if you wanted inpatient treatment, or if you had like a first fail protocol where an individual couldn't do inpatient, would not be eligible for inpatient uh, substance use disorder treatment until they had already successfully, I mean, failed, attempted and failed outpatient substance use disorder treatment. So those are different types of NQTLs. So you can compare and contrast those from QTLs as QTLs you can count. Generally, it's a number of days or a number of refills versus a non-quantitative, which is more of an analytic process to both determine and to evaluate uh, whether it exists and how it's applied. All right, next slide, please. Do well expectations of self-insured plans. We've talked about this um, earlier. This is just a restatement here as we dive into these uh, different QTL and NQTL requirements. Um, now, just practice caution when you're analyzing your plan features. A cursory review is never going to satisfy MAPIA. You can't just look over your SPDs and say that you are compliant with MAPIA. I mentioned this before. A lot of employers default on this, and I'm not, where, I'm not really sure where that came from, but this is a comprehensive analysis. You have to look at analytic standards underlying how your claims are reviewed, processed, and ultimately paid uh, or denied under the plan in order to assess whether and to what extent you're in compliance with the mandates of mental health parity. Right now, a lot of vendors uh, still cannot help you um, to do your audit, which is difficult because they have a lot of the census and the utilization information. You're going to have to get it from them and then take it off to another third party uh, independent professional services provider to help you put the report together. Properly. So it's going to involve a lot of players. Uh, uh, compliance of shortness is here on this. Next slide, please. All right, understanding visit pay classification. I've mentioned this already. So when you're doing your testing about when you're looking at whether your medical surgical benefits are offered in parity with the other uh, mental health and substance use disorder benefits covered under your plan, you're going to do this analysis by creating these two lists, all the benefits and treatments and services on the mental health side and all on the medical surgical side. You're going to break that down into benefits available under six different classifications, pharmacy, inpatient and network, inpatient at a network, outpatient and network, emergency services, and outpatient out of network. So you look at all those treatments and services available and you classify them and drop them into one of these six buckets. Now, respecting your um, out of network, your outpatient in network and outpatient out of network benefits. So just boxes four and six, those two classifications, you can have subclassifications of two types, an office visit or all other services. So when you're, when you're classifying all of your treatments and services under your plan and you get to four and six, you can break those down one additional time to account for office visits versus all other treatments and services. So this is the step one is identify all your benefits, your treatments and services, and put them in one of these categories. All right, next slide, please. Now, there's some, the next couple of slides are going to cover some special rules for when you're doing this classification exercise. The first one is tiered pharmacy formulary rules. They're very, very specific detailed rules about how and whether and to what extent you can impose a tiered pharmaceutical structure. What I mean by this is where you have like your generic tier, your brand tier, and maybe like a mail order tier. These different tiers of pharmaceutical availability or pre-authorization kind of baked in levels for an employer to make available under its coverage, um, or under its group health plans. So if you're going to have tiers uh, in your pharmaceuticals, there are only four different factors that you can use to differentiate your tiers. Uh, the first one is mail order versus pharmacy pickup. The second is generic versus brand. The third is efficacy of the underlying medication or pharmaceutical, and then the cost basis analysis that the, end up, that the employer conducts. Tiering is prohibited to the extent pharmaceuticals are classified based on their utilization in mental health and substance use disorder conditions. Be very careful. A lot of employers get stuffed up, stuffed up on that final bullet point. Um, this is not about utilization of that medication for mental health and substance use disorder. What it's about is your pharmacy, generally, when it's tiered, it has to look at the whole spectrum of pharmaceuticals that are available for all treatments and conditions and services and make sure, or, or illnesses and, and interactions, make sure that these that you don't go beyond these four uh, classification standards 
for those pharmaceuticals. You can't actually get down in and say, well, this medication is only available to treat mental health, and there's not a corresponding medication on the medical surgical side to compare this to. That will not fly. You have to go further than that in your analysis. All right, next, next slide, please. Now, there are, um, here's some additional um, requirements related to multiple network tiering. So a reasonable factor analysis required. What we mean here is if a plan or an issuer provides benefits through multiple network tiers, for example, you have like in-network preferred, in-network participating providers, then that employer may divide covered in-network benefits into subclassifications that reflect its existing network tiers. Tiering can be raised, it has to be based on reasonable factors, because this is the reasonable factor analysis, that's what it's called. There's only three of them. Um, quality, performance, and market standards. So after the tiers are established, the plan cannot impose additional financial requirements on QTLs or any QTLs respecting mental health and substance use disorder benefits across all tiers. If any tier is more restrictive than the financial requirement for QTLs or any QTLs for medical surgical benefits. So here, just at the end of the day, all we're doing is just going through a funnel exercise to say, okay, you have a reasonable factor here when you've got multiple network tiering. You can assess quality, performance, and market standards as reasonable factors in assessing and assigning and kind of setting up your limitations. But at the end of the day, remember, it's all got to come down to whether it's more restrictive in any tier than it would be with respect to your medical surgical benefits. All right, next slide, please. All right, bifurcation of classifications. I promise you we're going to get through the special rules here in just a moment. There's only uh, this and a couple of uh, get to it. For purposes of just determining parity for outpatient benefits versus in-network, um, when we're looking in-network versus out-of-network, a plan or issuer may further divide its benefits into two additional subclassifications. And I mentioned this earlier, you can have office visits and all other items and services, outpatient items and services. So you've got this extra little leeway here when you're preparing these benefit treatments and service lists to clump together all your office visits for outpatient benefits versus all your other items and services. And that's going to help with establishing parity, believe me, because what some of the most significant limitations here are quantitative and they were and they are related to office visits. So putting that into a separate category is going to make this analytic exercise a lot easier. Right, next slide, please. All right, part three. I'm going to pass it over to Bill, who's going to give you an introduction to identifying and evaluating QTLs. Thank you, Jason. So Jason outlined the intent of the law and went over a lot of the mechanics of how you have to set up your testing. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about the quantitative uh, treatment limitations and the non-quantitative treatment limitations. So this first section deals with the quantitative, and quantitative is just that. It's things that you can count or measure. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, limitations or differences in your plan benefits based upon the financial requirements under the benefit, and then also on the treatment limitations, which usually are annual limits, episode limits, uh, visit limits, those types of things. So your plan cannot impose a financial requirement or a QTL to mental health substance use disorder benefits in any classification. Remember those six classifications plus the two subclassifications. It can't put um, any financial requirement QTL in those classifications that's more restrictive than the predominant financial requirement. And anytime I say predominant, I mean that it's more than 50% of the total. And we're gonna be talking about total plan spend here. So uh, it cannot be more than 50% requirement on the financial or on the QTLs. It cannot be a type that is applied to substantially all the medical surgical benefits and substantially all is a different standard. That means two thirds or more uh, in, the, in the six classifications. The six classifications and the four subclassifications are the only ones that are permissible when you're determining the predominant financial requirement or the substantially all requirement uh, when you're doing your comparison. A plan may not create a separate subclassification for generalists and specialists. And this becomes very important. And I'll talk about um, generalists and specialists in a minute um, 
and, and how the networks are set up and preferred physicians and non-preferred in network out of network. So financial requirements, as I mentioned, these are what you might expect under your plan. Uh, they include deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximums. Uh, so those are the ones that um, we're going to be measuring on a predominant level. And then the quantitative treatment limitations are tied more to uh, limits or exclusions in the plan. So the annual limits, episode limits, lifetime limits, and um, the limits on the number of visits. That, that's what we're going to be measuring uh, when we're doing our comparison between uh, medical, surgical, and mental health substance use disorder benefits. Next. So let's look at the financial requirement first. Each financial requirement within a coverage unit, and I'll mention, I'll explain coverage unit in a second, must be analyzed separately in respect to each of the required benefit classifications. So you must look at uh, inpatient, in-network, compare the uh, financial requirements in that classification. Then you must compare the uh, financial requirements in in-network, outpatient. Do the same for pharmacy, emergency care, um, outpatient services, in-network, outpatient services, out-network. So you're gonna have to be doing the comparisons within each of those uh, benefit classification. A coverage unit refers to how you group individuals in your plan. So um, if you're going to do single or family or employee plus spouse, employee plus child, um, you can combine those or you can break them out separately. Um, but a coverage unit, you have to be consistent when you go across all the different uh, benefit classifications when you're determining benefits, premiums, and contributions. If you're going to have varying levels um, in the financial requirement and QTL uh, applying to the different coverage units that I just mentioned, the predominant level, the um, 50, more than 50%, is determined um, for each coverage unit basis. Jason mentioned that mere evaluation of plan design is inadequate. You can't look at your schedule of benefits and say, we have a $40 copayment uh, outpatient for in network and a $40 copayment um, for medical surgical and that's $40 copayment for mental health. That's not going to be enough. Under the law, you're going to have to do data analysis and you're going to have to apply mathematics to it so that you can justify it um, to the DOL if should they come knock in your door. This a uh, report that must be created, uh, as Jason mentioned when he explained the 2022 report to Congress, uh, nobody passed the, the requirements of the report. Um, and one of the main reasons for failure was that someone, uh, a lot of plans just said a cursory uh, mentioned that their, their financial requirements were the same for mental health substance abuse as they were for um, medical surgical benefits. Even high deductible health plans failed the outpatient and network classification. Uh, a lot of times that happened where preventive services for medical surgical were paid at 100%. And that ended up to that it ended up being um, more than substantially all of the, of the benefits paid under that um, benefit classification. So the plan failed for that reason. So you're going to have to conduct the analysis and you're going to have to uh, maintain the documentation to show that your plan is compliance with the, with the MPA. So uh, here we describe the differences on how you uh, review your uh, financial and your uh, treatment limitations. So you're going to and under number one there, you're going to assess whether a particular financial requirement, deductible, co-payment, co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximum, or the like, um, does that apply to substantially all, two-thirds, of the uh, medical surgical benefits in the same benefit classification? Again, we're in one of those six categories. If it's yes, you go down. Um, if the two-thirds analysis evaluates the dollar amount, plan payments, and if it's expected to be paid during the plan year, 
any reasonable calculation, you can come up with how you want to do this math. And you get down to um, doing the testing. And the testing is required. It's not required annually, but once you get um, your report created, you can maintain that uh, indefinitely until you have a plan design change or if you have significant demographics change during the uh, plan year. So if you undergo significant growth in the covered population or you add or change benefits to your plan design, you're going to have to retest your plan. Uh, under the predominant level, under uh, item two, again, predominant being more than 50%, um, do treatment limitations that are applied to medical surgical benefits uh, also apply to the uh, mental health substance use disorder? Um, and, and you want to make sure, again, that you're testing, um, comparing the two uh, side by side within each benefit category. Next. So uh, this slide describes what the effect of MPIA has been. Uh, you may recall that the original um, Mental Health Parity Act was passed in 2008, and um, the NIH, National Institute of Health, did a survey of how plans changed after uh, passage of the act. And this uh, table to the left comes from the uh, National Center for Biotechnology Information, which is part of NIH. And you can see the prohibited QTLs are listed down the left hand and they're highlighted in the dark blue boxes. Um, then to the right, you'll see uh, behavioral health combined. That's um, if you add the mental health and the substance use disorder benefits combined. Pre-MPIA, 42% of the plans um, had limitations. Post-MPIA, that dropped to two. And then it's broken out uh, to the right for mental health component of that and the substance use disorder component. And what you see as you go down um, through these prohibited QTLs, you'll see that pre-MPIA, a lot of plans had QTLs. Post-MPIA, they went down. So if to the right, we uh, do a little analysis of the chart, and you'll see that the um, in and out of network benefits, the most common pre-parity inpatient intermediate limits were combined daily limits with a median of 30 days. Um, they went away. The most common outpatient limit um, combined was 45 visits. All these limits pretty much disappeared um, two years after the law was passed by 2010. And by 2011, uh, virtually all QTLs from the audited plans had disappeared. So MPIA was very good at removing quantitative treatment limitations. And again, those are the ones that are very obvious to see. It's very easy to see if you're charging um, different financial co-payments or, um, or, or restrictions for uh, members or they were uh, limits on the number of days and visits. Again, those are very easy to see, and those all pretty much disappeared. So uh, what are some things that you can be alerted to when you're looking at your benefit plan uh, to give you an idea of whether you might have uh, a compliance conflict? And we put down a few of these here. Um, you can see that if you charge specialist copays for a mental health substance use disorder um, without performing analysis, um, th that could be a problem. If, if mental health substance use disorder is only available uh, through specialist copays, there are no um, primary care, uh, that could be a real problem when you do the math. You'll find out that uh, plan members are paying a lot more for mental health um, substance use disorder benefits than they are for medical surgical, that could cause a failure. Um, if you offer a composite of coinsurance and copays under a single classification, uh, you could um, see that you'd, you'd get in trouble with um, hitting the uh, predominantly all. 
if you have different financial requirements for substance health, uh, mental health and substance use disorder benefits um, in the same benefit classification, that's going to cause a failure. And then I'll let you read the, these other ones as you go down. Again, these are very obvious things that you can see just by reviewing. I will point out the one with the little phone down there. You do need to check your telehealth uh, benefits as well to make sure that there's the same access to care for a mental health substance use disorder benefits as there are for medical under your telehealth plan, or you could have problems, okay? So let's talk about the uh, non-quantitative treatment limitations or NQTLs. Uh, and these are a little more difficult to understand. And an NQTL uh, is a um, plan imposed limitation on the scope or duration of the benefits um, and treatment related to the services. So these are things that you don't necessarily see when you look at the plan. You have to dig in and get into the data. Um, and PIB has protections to prohibit plans from imposing these NQTLs on people uh, receiving mental health and substance use disorder benefits. Um, and they may be written or they just may be in practice. And uh, again, that's why you need to get into the data and figure out to make sure that uh, the data supports that mental health and medical surgical benefits are being paid at the same um, level, same parity. It, if you do um, have exclusions or limitations, um, they will, uh, MPIA does allow an exclusion if you can prove that um, they are in parity within the same benefit classification. Next. So, um, as I mentioned, you cannot just look at the plan and determine whether or not you're, you have these non-quantitative treatment limitations. You must have a very comprehensive analysis performed, an audit performed of your plan uh, to uncover any instances of NQTL violations. The review has to be thorough, and it has to um, go through plan documents as well as your um, benefits data of the uh, TPA or insurer, and you have to review your plan documents as well. It's not just the data. So a comprehensive review would generally include uh, your operations to make sure that your claim process payments um, don't apply any different types of limitations or requirements upon claimants seeking mental health benefits. Um, you have to make sure that your plan documents are in um, concert under ERISA and they're up to date um, to make and also make sure that all disclosures have been made to your plan participants. And then you have to review your policies and procedures um, and, and audit the internal guidelines of the plan to make sure uh, you're in compliance with MPA. Okay. So um, when I talk about a comprehensive uh, evaluation, first thing you need to do is you need to identify um, who's making claim determinations or claim denials under your plan and to make sure that um, they are the right people with the right training and expertise to make those uh, decisions and to process those reviews. Um, if you require a doctor to review um, it, the, the claims process requires a doctor to review mental health substance use disorder claims, but you're using um, just an experienced claim rep to make the determinations under a medical surgical benefit. That would be a difference, and that would be problematic. Um, you also want to look, when you're reviewing the data, you want to see are mental health claims being denied at a more frequent basis? Are uh, appeals being are mental health claims being overturned on appeal on a more frequent basis? Um, you want to uh, just compare how denials, mental health, substance use disorder are being compared to the medical surgical benefits. Uh, those are all things the uh, DOL is going to want to see uh, to prove that your plan is meeting the requirements of MPIA. Um, there is no requirement to utilize the same NQTL. This is very important. What their uh, DOL is looking for is they want to see the outcome is equal or is in parity 
not necessarily the process, but if the outcome is not equal, then they're going to review the process. And that's very important because um, sometimes mental health uh, claims need to be reviewed differently, and that's fine, but we got to make sure that um, claims are being paid in parity with the medical surgical claims. And then again, most importantly of all, you must document and archive all the information. If the DOL comes and asks you for a copy of your report showing that your plan is in parity, you have 45 days to respond to their request. And uh, as Jason mentioned earlier, that can be difficult to um, do if you haven't done it in advance and gotten all your information together. It's a very, very complex um, report um, that will run into the hundreds of pages, not something you want to have to create and uh, publish within 45 days. So how do you get in compliance? Jason went through a um, schedule earlier, but the first thing you can do is you can start looking at your plan to see, get a general feel for how far you are from center if you're in violation of NPSO. If you have a lot of overly stringent pre-authorization requirements before people can access um, mental health or substance use disorder um, benefits, that's problematic. Um, if you're requiring written treatment plans of mental health, but you're not doing the same for medical surgical. I'm not going to go through all these, but um, if uh, one down at the bottom there, or two thirds of the way down, applied behavioral analysis. Uh, Jason mentioned this earlier. That's a treatment primarily for uh, autism. Um, but if you tie that to an age, uh, which is very common, um, that could versus tying it to medical necessity, that could be a violation of MPEA, and you have to be uh, very careful. Uh, and again, I won't go through all these, but if you require different levels of expertise, if there's no requirement or, or if there are no providers um, for mental health in the um, general practitioner level, then and everyone has to go to a specialist that causes an artificial barrier that would cause you to be in violation of MPS. So there's a lot of things you have to review. Next. Okay. So uh, just to give you some examples, um, when you're looking out of network reimbursement rates. So if you have in that unequal reimbursement rates established via Medicare. So sometimes um, your medical plan will tie your reimbursements to providers based on what the Medicare reimbursement rates are. And uh, if you do that um, and you're paying more for medical surgical than you would for a mental health substance use disorder um, by using different percentage rates, you could get in trouble. And that, that happens quite a bit. Uh, these are things that actually came out of the report of the plans they reviewed. Um, if someone goes to the doctor for medical surgical and gets evaluated um, and they get charged a, a, an amount, someone goes to, to get a mental health um, evaluation and they get paid on a lesser amount or that they pay the doctor a lesser amount, um, that would be cause of a violation. Uh, if there are um, different uh, sets of factors to establish reimbursement rates. So if reimbursement rates are um, determined um, by geogra geography, supply and demand, uh, market dynamic, those things, then um, you have to be careful that the mental health substance use disorder are not adversely impacted by how that evaluation is made. And again, got to make sure that the um, patient is doesn't have any barriers or the plan member doesn't have any barriers to receive the treatment. Um, and that can either be financial or um, limitations on, on how far they have to travel and things like that. Next. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jason so he can talk a little bit about the uh, disclosure requirements under MPEA because this is something that um, you may or may not be aware of and it's obviously something that you must um, be in compliance with. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. All right, so this is um, our last substantive piece of the program today. Now, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but there are some disclosure requirements that employers as plan sponsors need to be aware of respecting mental health parity. First, uh, the plan administrator uh, or the carrier or the insurance issuer 
has to make available the criteria for medical necessity determinations made under its plan. So here you have to be able to produce to a participant or the DOL the criteria that you're going to apply for medical necessity determinations with respect to mental health and substance use disorder benefits. So um, that's part one. You got to have that cri the criteria spelled out, uh, written in a memorialized in a document. The plan administrator or health insurance issuer must make available a reason for any denial of your group health plan or group or individual coverage of reimbursement or payment for services with respect to mental health substance use disorder benefits, respecting any participant, beneficiary, or enrollee. So whenever there is a denial of a claim, mental health or substance use disorder benefits, that the reason for the denial uh, has to include uh, your factors in your analysis related to how you determined or created any QTL or NQTL or other limitation and how it was applied with respect to that claim. The internal claims and appeals rules include the right of claimants or their authorized representatives. So this could be your spouse or their attorney. It could be a parent if it's a child uh, receiving treatment or service. Um, the right to be entitled, uh, the right to be provided free of charge, along with reasonable access to and copies of documents, records, and all other information relevant to the claimant's claim for benefits. So this, think of this as kind of like um, a full ERISA appeal under MAPIA. We're looking at the full administrative record and the participant or the enrollee is going to have access to all of the information that relates to the claim. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing on our disclosure requirements, uh, this also includes documents that were information regarding the underlying processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, and other factors used to apply in QTL. We've used those that statement there, you've seen a few times today. So that's what the UL wants. Is they want information about the processes, strategies, the evidentiary standards, and other factors that an, employ that an employer factors into its decision of whether to apply and how an QTL is applied. With respect to group health plans that are subject to ERISA, if coverage is denied based on medical necessity, then you've got to provide that criteria, as we mentioned before. Now, here's an extension of that is it's got to be provided within 30 days of any request to a participant. Um, so they can actually submit a request prior to incurring the claim for service or submitting a claim for service, and you have to tell them up front whether it's going to be covered. And if so, what rate? Um, if a plan or plan administrator or health insurance fails, insurance issuer fails to provide these documents, a quote, may hold it liable for up to $110 a day from the date of the failure to provide these documents. Now, as you can see, that's not a substantial compliance penalty, non-compliance penalty, and $100 a day is going to break most employers. But if, if that plan in QTL is imposed, it affects many different plan participants, and those participants come together then and, and request these disclosures, you could get into a problem pretty quickly, and this number gets to add up. Um, so think about that and really focus more on the fact of why participants need this information rather than what's the punitive structure that's designed to make you comply. The underlying spirit of the rules is that participants get the information they need to make informed decisions about their health care, the treatments and services related to mental health and substance use disorder, and that they're able to get those services fairly and equally under the, under the coverage offered by the employer with respect to medical surgical benefits. Next slide. All right, so this is just an overview of your MAPIA imposed requirement, required participant disclosures. This is the types of, these are the types of information that you may have to produce. You may have to do compliance reports. You definitely have to produce your QTL and NQTL testing records, claims volume, proprietary claims, if you have any, necessary, necess necessity criteria, so when you are making those criteria determinations, uh, analysis factors, what are the factors you consider in imposing any type of limitation or in denying any claim, uh, all of the information related to a claim denial at any level. So that could be an initial claim, a first or a second appeal, and then necessity guidelines. All right, next slide, please. Uh, participant disclosure best practice. This is one of our final kind of best practices. Provide and explain the reason for benefit denials um, make sure they include applicable medical necessity criteria that was applied to the participant, beneficiary, or enrollee. So just always make sure you're putting that medical necessity criteria in your claim denials. Remember, plans and issuers cannot refuse to disclose information that's necessary for a parity analysis on the basis that that information is proprietary or has commercial value. Those arguments are void or moot. Plans and issuers are permitted to provide summary descriptions of the medical necessity criteria in layperson's terms. And that's actually advantageous to providing the contract terms and the medical uh, analysis terms. 
Finally, documentation evidencing the FDA compliance requirements adherence should be maintained for at least six years from the date it was last used, from the date it was drafted, in accordance with ERISA retention requirements. All right, next slide, please. That brings us to the end, and I'm going to pass it back over to Marie, our moderator, for our question and answer session and to provide the credit information for today's program. All right, thank you, Jason. I am just going to skip over a couple of slides as we get um, question and answer session started. Um, just for anybody who needs uh, the credit uh, for today's session, we're gonna be showing these as I get to the questions. So first question uh, that is coming in, <clears throat> Bill, I think I'm gonna give this one to you. Um, our plan was adopted from pre-written plan documents provided by our TPA. Our plan is self-funded and the documents were provided by the TPA included a plan document and incorporated SPD along with some certificates. How do I, we identify the QTLs and NQTLs in these and change offending provisions? So a review of your plan documents is the great first step to assess compliance with MPEA. Um, however, since you're sponsoring a self-insured benefit plan, you've got to do a complete audit of the plan. And that's going to include document review, um, review of uh, claims practices, and then, of course, the data analysis to assure that you're in compliance with MPEA. Now, when it comes to the plan documents, um, first thing you'd want to do is go through and see if there are any lifetime limits on mental health substance use disorder or um, that are more restrictive than medical surgical benefits. Likewise, you want to see if there's any annual dollar limits. Uh, different co-payments, co-insurance, deductibles on uh, mental health and substance use disorder. Also want to look at your uh, provider networks to make sure that uh, mental health uh, providers are available and to make sure that um, they're not always considered specialists or, or charged at the higher copay limits because that could be problematic. Um, also want to be careful, see if there's any mention of blanket requirements for prior authorization. Um, or for treatment of mental health, and then go to your exclusions and limitations page, look for any limitations or exclusions for treatments of autism, substance abuse, uh, nutrition counseling, drug testing, residential treatment, anything like that. Um, just that's the first step, and you can see where you are. But again, uh, that's not going to guarantee that you're in compliance. You're going to have to go back to your third-party administrator, to your insurance carrier and get them um, to provide proof that they have uh, met the requirements of MPA with their claim practices. And that's only um, can be done through data analysis and a thorough review of their, their, their processing uh, requirements. Wow, that's a lot. All right, um, next question. This will be for you, Jason. Uh, respecting the DOL's uh, uh, Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act report to Congress, and subsequent enforcement agent activities by the agency. Um, have you seen a difference in the volume of investigations and or aggressiveness by the Department of Labor? That's a good question. Um, okay, yeah, I, we have seen an increase in the volume of investigations. I think whether and to what extent the DOL is aggressive in nature with respect to their enforcement activities is kind of based on the, the individual case and how you interpret their activity and their enforcement uh, authority. Excuse me. Um, but I think what you're going to see from the DOL is not necessarily more aggressive or more volume of, of you won't see a higher volume, but I wouldn't focus on that so much as I would the complexity of these of these requests and these audits. How they're getting it's like peeling onion, like layers of an onion is that whole analogy. Like they're not going to just look at the overall operation of your plan or your plan document, whereas they might do that on a general DOL audit. Here they're going to look at the evidentiary standards and the processes, the analytics. They're really going to break down how you um, implement and administer any type of restrictions related to mental health or substance use disorder benefits. So you want to be on the cutting edge of that and be on the front end of it and identify it before they do and, and take action. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I've heard of several federal lawsuits related to wilderness therapy um, where employees have been individually sued for violating MPIA. Uh, can you explain how these cases work and how to defend against such claims by an employee or a participant? Um, Bill, I think that question would be for you. Okay. Uh, wilderness therapy is um, 
a form of residential mental and behavioral health treatment um, that it includes non-traditional outdoor treatment or, or uh, something in a natural setting. And it's become more and more popular over the last decade or so. Um, the programs normally involve um, an enrollment fee and then a uh, pretty expensive uh, daily treatment fee. Um, a lot of the health carers responded immediately when these programs came out and said, we don't pay for wilderness therapy. And that's what generated lawsuits under ERISA and, and or MPIA. Um, interestingly, um, a few cases were dismissed, but more interestingly, uh, a number of cases, the court has found that there is reason to look into it a little further. So um, I'm not aware of any cases that have been decided yet, but they are ongoing. Um, so it's probably pretty important to for a plan sponsor to know that they are at risk of being sued if they um, have a blanket exclusion for wilderness therapy. Um, I know that one of the courts um, said that if they can't explain why it's not covered other than it takes place outdoors um, that they were not going to dismiss the claim for that reason there it, it has to be more substantial than that um, so and then another court i think said that um, the plan allowed permitted coverage for intermediate residential programs to treat mental illnesses and to treat medical illnesses um, but it had excluded uh, wilderness therapy so the court said that's not consistent and um, not reaching uh, the standard of parity. So I guess the answer to the question is these cases are still being decided. They are, are uh, pretty frequent, um, the, one of the most frequent under the mental health parity law, um, but they haven't all been decided yet. I would caution against adopting any sort of blanket exclusion for wilderness therapy or any type of therapy. Um, without investigating it further and making sure you have um, stuff built into your plan document, uh, wording in your plan document and your claims practice to make sure that you're not going to be in violation of MPA. So um, it's it's kind of a still up in the air, but um, we're keeping our eye on it. Yeah, great. And, and Bill, I'd like to add to that. Another, another one where we're seeing a lot of litigation activity is related to not only um, lawyer's therapy, but also eating disorders. Uh, eating disorders, so treatment, be it outpatient or residential, uh, those frequently make it into federal litigation. So if you have blanket exclusions related to eating disorders management or treatment, you might want to visit those as well. Um, one closing note for everyone, um, our second part of this series was so going to air in about two months, a couple months, and it was in part two of our MAPIA series, we'll actually focus on the nuts and bolts of performing the DOL's comparative analysis. So it's going to be a little bit deeper level. Uh, this was really an introductory overview. That program is going to get a little more into the creation of your analysis and the, and the conducting of that with your vendors. So make sure you join us for part two of this. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, I want to bring it to a close. Um, showing you everybody on our national regulatory compliance team. Uh, we're here for you. Um, so as a reminder, we are going to be sending out the slides afterwards. And if you had questions that we didn't get to, we will certainly uh, do our best to answer those as well. I want to thank you for your time and attention today and have a great rest of your day.